Section two of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume One, Section two, by H. M. Guatkin. The treaty might be hollow, but it kept the peace for nearly eight years. If Constantine was evidently the stronger, Licinius was still too strong to be rashly attacked, so each went his own way. It soon appeared which was the better statesman. Constantine drew nearer to the Christians, while Licinius drifted into persecution, devising annoyances enough to make them enemies, but not enough to make them harmless. Thus Constantine allows manumission in churches, judges the Donatists, closes the courts on Sundays, loads the churches with gifts, and at last, May 323, frees Christians from all pagan ceremonies of state. Licentius drove the Christians from his court, forbade meetings of bishops, and meddled vexatiously with their worship. This gave the war something of a religious character, but its occasion was not religious. The Goths had been pretty quiet since Aurelian had settled them in Dacia it was not till three twenty two that rasimod their king crossed the danube on a foray constantine drove them back chased them beyond the danube slew rasimod and settled thousands of gothic serfs in the adjacent provinces but in the pursuit he crossed the territory of licentius and this led to war constantine's army was one hundred and thirty thousand men strong and his son crispus had a fleet of two hundred sail in the Piraeus. Licinius awaited him with a hundred and sixty thousand men near Hadrianopoli, while his admiral, Amandus, was to hold the Hellespont with three hundred and fifty ships. There was no idea of using the fleet to take Constantine in the rear. After some difficult maneuvers, Constantine won the first battle, 3 July 323, but was brought to a stop before the walls of Byzantium, Licinius was safe there, so long as he held the sea, so he chose Martinianus, his magister officiorum, for the new Augustus of the West. Meanwhile, Constantine strengthened his fleet, and his son Crispus completely defeated Amandus in the Hellespont. Licinius left Byzantium to defend itself. It had held out two years against Severus, and prepared to maintain the Asiatic shore constantine left byzantium on one side and landed near chrysopolis where he found the whole army of licinius drawn up to meet him the battle of chrysopolis eighteen or twenty september three twenty three was decisive licinius fled to nicomedia and presently constantia came out to ask for her husband's life it was granted and constantine confirmed his promise with an oath Nevertheless, Licentius was put to death in October 325 on a charge of treasonable intrigue. The charge is unlikely, but Licinius was quite capable of it, and his execution does not seem to have estranged Constantia from her brother. But perhaps the matter is best connected with the family tragedy, which we shall come to presently. As a general, Constantine ranks high among the emperors. Good soldiers, as they mostly were, none but severus and aurelian could boast of any such career of victory as had brought constantine from the shores of britain to the banks of the tiber and the walls of byzantium but after the crowning mercy of chrysopolis there was no more fighting except with the goths the last fourteen years of constantine three twenty three through three thirty seven were years of peace and the first question which then confronted him was the question of religion by what road did he approach Christianity, and how far did he come on the journey? Two fables may be dismissed at once. The heathen fable told by Zosimus in the 5th century, that Christians were complacent when the philosophers refused to absolve him for the murder of his son Crispus, and the papal fable of the 8th century, that he was healed of leprosy by Pope Sylvester, and thereupon gave him dominion over the palace the city of rome and the entire west these legends are summarily refuted by the fact that he was baptized in three thirty seven not as they tell us in three twenty six 
turning now to history we have no reason to suppose that he owed christian impressions to his mother's teaching but constantius was an eclectic of the better sort and a man of some culture and his memory contrasted well with that of his colleagues constantine seems to have begun where his father left off as more or less monotheistic and averse to idols and more or less friendly to the christians and all these things grew upon him the last of them may not have meant much at first but even hostile emperors like severus and diocletian had sense enough to keep on good terms with the christians when they were not prepared to crush them but constantine was drawn to them personally as well as politically by his pure life and genuine humanity as well as by his shrewd statesmanship their lofty monotheism and austere morals attracted the man their strong organization arrested the attention of the ruler when diocletian threw down his challenge to the church he made religion the urgent question of the time and the persecution was a visible failure before constantine was well settled in gaul if diocletian had failed to crush the church others were not likely to secede maximin or licinius might hearken back to the past but constantine saw clearly that the empire would have to make some sort of terms with the church so that the only question was how far it would be needful or safe to go for the moment a little friendliness to the gaulish bishops was enough to secure the goodwill of the christians all over the empire then came the wars of three twelve through three thirteen which forced on constantine and licinius the championship of the christians and made it plain good policy to give them full legal toleration licinius stopped there and constantine did not make up his mind without anxiety the god of the christians had shown great power and might be the best protector and in any case a firm alliance with their strong hierarchy would not only remove a great danger but give the very help which the empire needed on the other hand it was a serious thing to break with the past and brave the terrors of heathen magic moreover the christians were a minority even in the east and he could not openly go over to them without risk of a pagan reaction so he moved cautiously christianity differed forsooth very little from the better sort of heathenism they could both be brought under the broad shield of monotheism if the heathens would give up their idols and immoral worships and the christians would not insist too rudely on that awkward doctrine of the deity of christ on these terms the lion of christianity might lie down with the lamb of eclecticism and the guileless emperor would be the little child to lead them both the problem of church and state was new for the old religion of rome was never more than a department of the state and the worshippers of isis and mithras readily conformed to the ceremonies of the roman people but when christianity made a practical distinction between caesar's things and god's the relation of church and state became a difficult question constantine handled it with great skill and much success he not only made the christians thoroughly loyal but won the active support of the churches and obtained such influence over the bishops that they seemed almost willing to sink into a department of the state but he forgot one thing the surface thought of his time christian as well as heathen tended to a vague monotheism which looked on christ and the son as almost equally good symbols of the supreme and this obscured the deeper conviction of the christians that the deity of christ is as essential as the unity of god after all christianity is not a monotheistic philosophy but a life in christ when this conviction asserted itself with overwhelming power at the council of nicaea constantine gave way with a good grace as it had been decided at saxa rubra that the empire was to fight beneath the cross of god so now it was decided at nicaea that the cross was to be the cross of christ and not the sun god's cross of light we may doubt whether constantine took in the full meaning of the decision but at any rate it meant that the christians refused to be included with others in a monotheistic state religion if the empire was to have their full friendship it must become definitely christian and this is the goal to which constantine 
seems to have looked forward in his later years though he can hardly have hoped himself to reach it heathenism was still strong and he continued to use vague monotheistic language only in his last illness did he feel it safe to throw off the mask and avow himself a christian let there be no ambiguity said he as he asked for baptism and then he laid aside the purple and passed away in the white robe of a christian neophyte twenty two may three thirty seven this would seem to be the general outline of constantine's religious life and policy we can now return to the morrow of chrysopolis and take it in more detail now that he was master of the empire he made his alliance with the christians as close as he could without abandoning the official neutrality of his monotheism his attitude is well shown by his coins mars and genius p r disappear after saxa rubra or at latest by three seventeen so invictus by three fifteen or at any rate three twenty three coins of jupiter augustus seem to have been struck only for licentius later on the heathen inscriptions are replaced by phrases as neutral as the cross itself like beata tranquillitas or providentia augustus or instinctu divinitas on his on his triumphal arch at rome his laws kept pace with the coins in form they are mostly neutral but they show an increasing leaning to christianity thus his edict for the observance of the venerable day of the sun only raised it to the rank of the heathen ferrier by closing the law courts and the latin prayer he imposed on the army the first case known of prayer in an unknown tongue is quite indeterminate as between christ and jupiter so too when before three sixteen he sanctioned manumissions in churches it was only taking a hint from the manumissions in certain temples yet again when in three thirteen and by later law he exempted the clergy of the catholic church not those of the sects from the decorianate and other burdens he gave them only the privileges already enjoyed by some of the heathen priests and teachers but the relief was great enough to cause an ungodly rush for holy orders and with it such a loss of taxpayers that in three twenty he had to forbid the ordination of any one qualified for the curia of his city none but the poor and an occasional official could now be ordained and those only to fill vacancies caused by death the second limitation may not have been enforced but the first remained to save the revenue the church was debased at a stroke other laws however lean more to a side like the edict of three nineteen which threatens to burn the jews if they stone a convert to the worship of god no doubt such converts needed protection and roman law was not squeamish about burning criminals if they were of low rank upon the whole this policy of official neutrality and personal favor powerfully stimulated the growth of the churches the time servers were all christian now and eusebius plainly denounces their unspeakable hypocrisy at least in later years constantine himself had to rebuke bishops for flattery the defeat of licinius enabled him to come forward more openly as the patron of the churches his letter to the provincials of the empire eusebius naturally gives the copy which went to palestine begins with high praise of the confessors and strong denunciation of the persecutors whose wickedness is shown by their miserable ends they would have destroyed the republic if the divinity had not raised up me constantine from the war west of britain to destroy them he then restores rank and property to all the victims of persecution in the islands the mines and the houses of forced labor and finishes with an earnest exhortation to the worship of the one true god but after all the church was not quite what constantine wanted it to be he was not more attached to it by its lofty monotheism than by the imposing unity which promised new life to the weary state for six hundred years the world had been in quest of a universal religion stoicism was no more than a philosophy for the few the worship of the emperor was debased by officialism and by this time quite outworn and even mithraism had never shown such living power as christianity 
here then was something that could realize the religious side of the empire in a nobler form than augustus or hadrian had ever dreamed of a universal church that could stand beside the universal empire and worthily support its labors for the peace and welfare of the world but for this purpose unity was essential if the church was divided against itself it could not help the empire worse than this it could hardly be divided against itself without being also divided against the empire one of the parties was likely to appeal to the emperor and then he would have to decide between them and make an enemy of the defeated party and if he tried to enforce his decision they were likely to resist him as stubbornly as the whole church had resisted the heathen emperors this would bring back the whole difficulty of the persecutions though possibly on a smaller scale to put it shortly the christians had a conscience in matters of religion and sometimes mistook self-will for conscience constantine had experience of christian self-will in africa soon after the defeat of maxentius when diocletian commanded the christians to give up their sacred books all parties agreed in refusing to obey those who did obey were called traditores but the officers did not always care what books they took might apocryphal books be given up so thought mensurius of carthage while others counted it apostasy to give up any books at all the controversy became acute at the death of mensurius in three eleven when felix of aptunga consecrated his successor but that right was claimed by secundus of tigesus the senior bishop of numidia who consecrated a rival bishop of carthage it was some time before the donatists as they soon came to be called got their position clear they held that felix was a traditor that the ministrations of a traditor are null and void and that a church which has communion with a traditor is apostate after the battle of sax rubra constantine sent money to Cecilian for the clergy of the catholic church and as he had heard that some evil disposed persons were troubling them he directed Cecilian to refer them to the civil authorities for punishment thereupon they appealed to him constantine seems to have contemplated a small court to try the case miliades of rome three gaulish bishops and apparently the archdeacon of rome but a small council met instead october three thirteen at rome which pronounced for Cecilian. the donatists were furious and appealed again this time constantine summoned as many bishops as he could directing each to bring so many clergy and servants with him giving him power to use the state post cursus publicus for the journey so a large council of the western churches met at arles in august three fourteen possibly three fifteen even britain sent bishops from london york and some other place it destroyed the donatist contention by deciding that felix was not a triator it also settled some more outstanding controversies in favor of the roman date of easter and the roman custom of not repeating heretical baptism if it had been given in the name of the trinity the decisions were sent to sylvester of rome for circulation not for confirmation we can recognize in arles the pattern of the nicene council still the donatists were not satisfied they asked the emperor to decide the matter himself and he unwillingly consented he heard them at milan november three sixteen and once more decided against them then they turned round and said what business has the emperor to meddle with the church a vigorous prosecution was begun but with small success a band of donatist fanatics called circumcellones ranged the country committing disorders and defying the authorities to make martyrs of them even in three seventeen constantine ordered that their outrages were not to be retaliated and when they sent him a message in three twenty one that they would in no way communicate with that scoundrel his bishop he stopped the persecution as useless and frankly gave them toleration africa was fairly quiet for the rest of his reign after the defeat of licinius constantine found several disputes in the eastern churches the old easter question was still unsettled the Miletian schism was dividing egypt and there was no knowing how far the arian controversy would spread 
unity must be restored at once and that by the old plan of calling a council the churches had long been in the habit of conferring together when difficulties arose they could refuse to recognize an unsatisfactory bishop and circa three sixty nine a council ventured to depose paul of samisata and aurelian had enforced its decision the weak point of this method was that rival councils could be got up so that every local quarrel had an excellent chance of becoming a general controversy arianism in particular was setting council against council constantine determined to go a step beyond these local meetings as he had summoned the western bishops to arles so now he summoned all the bishops of christendom if he could bring them to a decision it was not likely to be disputed and in any case he could safely give it the force of law an ecumenical council would be a grand demonstration not only of the unity of the church but of its close alliance with the empire so he issued invitations to all christian bishops to meet him at nicaea in bithynia in the summer of three twenty five to make a final end of all the disputes which rent the unity of christendom the program was even wider than at arles but the donatists were not included in it constantine could let sleeping dogs lie we note here the choice of nicaea for its auspicious name the city of victory and convenience of access and we see in it one of the many signs that the true centre of the empire was settling down somewhere near the bosphorus we need not closely analyze the imposing list of bishops present from almost every province of the empire with a few from beyond its frontiers in the far east and north legend made them three hundred and eighteen the holy number of the cross of jesus we have lists in sundry languages none of them giving more than two hundred and twenty one names but these are known to be incomplete the actual number may have been near three hundred all the thirteen great dioceses of the empire were represented except britain and illyricum though only single bishops came from africa spain gaul and dacia only one came in person from italy though two presbyters appeared for the bishop of rome so the vast majority came from the eastern provinces of the empire the outsiders were four or five theopolis bishop of the goths beyond the danube Catherius, the name is corrupt of the crimean bosphorus john the persian and ristasis the armenian the son of gregory the illuminator with perhaps another armenian bishop eusebius is full of enthusiasm over his majestic role of churches far and near from the extremity of europe to the furthest ends of asia it was a day of victory for both the empire and the church the empire had not only made peace with the stubbornness of its enemies but been accepted as its protector and guide the church had won the greatest of all its victories when galerius issued his edict of toleration but its mission to the whole world had never been so vividly embodied as by that august assembly we miss half the meaning of the council if we overlook the tremulous hope and joy of those first years of world-wide victory athanasius shows it even more than eusebius one thing at least is clear the new world faced the old and the spell of the holy roman empire had already begun to work constantine took up at once the position of a moderator he began by burning unread the budget of complaints against each other which the bishops had presented to him he then preached them a sermon on unity and unity was his text all through he was much more anxious to make the decisions unanimous than to influence them one way or another his one object was to make an end of division in the churches so whatever pleased the bishops pleased the emperor too easter was fixed according to the custom of rome and alexandria for the sunday after the full moon following the vernal equinox it is the role we have now and though it did not produce complete unity till the lunar cycle was quite settled it secured that easter should come after the passover for said constantine how can we who are christians keep the same day as those ungodly jews the Miletian schism was peacefully settled to the disgust of anathasius in later years by giving the Miletian clergy a status next to the orthodox with a right of secession if found worthy so far well 
but the condemnation of arianism may have been something of a trial to constantine who could not quite see why they thought it worth while to be so hot on such a trifling question as the deity of christ however that may be arianism was politically impossible he must have known already from hosius that the west would not accept it and the first act of the council meant its most unanimous rejection by the east as soon as there was no doubt what the decision would be he did his best to make it quite unanimous all the arts of imperial persuasion were tried on the waverers till in the end only two stubborn recusants remained to be sent into exile to some wider aspects of the council we shall return hereafter for the moment it may be enough to say that constantine had won a great success he had not only got his question settled but had himself taken a conspicuous part in settling them more than this he had established formal relations no longer with bishops or groups of bishops but with a great confederacy of churches the churches had long been tending to organize themselves on the lines of the empire as we see in cyprian's theories and now constantine made the church an alter ego of the state and gave it a concrete unity of the political sort which it never had before henceforth the holy catholic church of the creeds was more and more limited to the confederation of churches recognized by the state so that it only remained to compel all men to come into these and prevent the formation of any other religious communities in this way the church became much more useful to the state and also perhaps fitter to resist the shock of the barbarian conquest which followed but surely something was lost in freedom and spirituality and therefore also in practical morality we pass from the council of nicaea to a family tragedy so far constantine may pass as fairly merciful to the plotters of his own house maximian bassanius and licentius had all tried to assassinate him and if he put to death bassianus see page eight he had spared maximian till he plotted again and so far he had spared licentius also but now in a few months from october three twenty five he puts to death not only licentius but his own son crispus and the younger licentius then his own wife fausta and then a number of his friends the facts are certain but their exact meaning is obscure it must however be noticed that the dynastic policy of diocletian had given a new political importance to members of an imperial family the widows of the third century emperors fall into obscurity but the widow of galerius is first sought in marriage by maximin Deza, then executed by licinius who also put to death the children of severus Deza and galerius now constantine married twice and there may well have been a bitter division in his family minervina was the mother of crispus whom we have seen greatly distinguishing himself in the war with licinius and there seems no serious doubt that the three younger sons were children of faustus though the eldest of them was not born till three fifteen or three sixteen eight years after her marriage so we come to the questions we cannot answer was constantine jealous of his eldest son or anxious to get him out of the way of the others or was crispus a plotter justly put to death and how came fausta to share his fate a little later they are not likely to have been accomplices in a plot or connected by a guilty passion though the story of sosimus is not impossible that she accused him falsely and was herself put to death for it when helena convicted her we have not material enough for any decided opinion the worst point it may be against constantine is that he did not spare the young licentius if he was the son of constantia he cannot have been more than twelve years old but the allusions to him suggest that he was something more than a boy and we know that constantia was on the best of terms with her brother when she died a couple of years later if constantine suspected the elder licentius the new sultanism would involve the younger in his fate and if crispus had married helena his daughter suspicion might attach to him too fausta's fate is the mystery or was constantine more or less out of his mind that winter as despots occasionally are one or two of his laws may point that way and the possibility may help to explain a good deal End of section two.